Well, good evening, everyone. You're all so punctual. And the room got really quiet right at 6 o'clock. So, <laughs> so I thought, why not start right on time? Um, well, welcome. I'm Sarah Krajewski, the Robert and Mercedes Eichholz Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Portland Art Museum. It's my pleasure to host you all this evening and host our speaker, exhibiting artist Rodrigo Valenzuela. Uh, before I say a few words of introduction, um, I'd like to offer my thanks to the Contemporary Art Council of the Portland Art Museum. Uh, they're sponsoring a reception for the artist um, after the talk tonight, so if you have a moment, please join us upstairs in the trustee room. It's on the fourth floor, um, and we'll all head up there afterwards for more conversation. Uh, if you're not familiar with this group, the Contemporary Art Council is an advocacy and membership group. Uh, through their membership dues and other fundraising events, they support the contemporary art programming here at the museum, both with acquisitions and with exhibition support. So I'm really grateful for all the efforts that the council members uh, put forward to support what I'm doing here. Uh, of course, council members get perks, uh, like invitations to special events, receptions, um, artist talks, and studio visits uh, throughout the year. Um, we also have educational opportunities like reading seminars and other, uh, other events. So if you'd like to know more about what we're up to, um, please, we've got a, some brochures and brag sheets around, so grab one um, or talk to me afterwards and I'll, um, uh, I'd be happy to sign you up. Uh, and now tonight's speaker, Rodrigo Valenzuela. It's been so great to have Rodrigo's work on view here for the past few months. I met Rodrigo uh, a number of years ago when he was an MFA student at the University of Washington. And um, his work at that early point in his career already made a strong impression on me. It's really been wonderful to see the continuing development of his work in photography, video, and installation and to see his career really take off uh, of late. He's had shows around the world, recognized with many awards, and recently he was appointed a faculty member at uh, UCLA's prestigious, renowned art school. So, um, congratulations. <laughs> uh, Portland audiences have been treated to some wonderful exhibitions um, at up Gallery, and I'd like to thank Theo Downs Le Guin, Melissa Soltes, and Heather Birdsong for their um, efforts in helping us bring the show um, together. Now, I hope you've all had a chance to see the exhibition. It's on the third floor of the Center for Modern and Contemporary Art. But if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, the galleries are open until 8 o'clock tonight. And from the reception space upstairs, you'll be able to access the galleries. So there's no excuse not to go and see the work again. It's worth repeated viewing. Um, the works upstairs, um, in them you'll see Rodrigo's use of staged scenes and digital interventions in works that manipulate the codes of representation to affect a viewer's perception of logic and reality. The works utilize imagery rooted in the contradictory traditions of documentary and, fic and fiction, often involving narratives around immigration and the working class. So with that, please join me in welcoming Rodrigo. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, up for and thank you all for coming. I'm gonna show you this video and then I'm gonna talk. I am, my, I'm losing my voice, so I'm gonna show a lot more videos than <laughs> often. But um, yeah, I'm gonna start with this video I did during my MFA, and I'm gonna move quickly through my initial photography to like show you uh, my newest work and talk in depth about the the work I'm presenting here and where it comes from. But it's a very strong and direct linear development of my ideas through my career. So uh, can you turn the lights completely off, please? de los coyotes donde donde reúnen a toda la gente que ellos van a pasar que será un mínimo como de 80 personas o hasta 100 personas en un cuarto más o menos este espacio más o menos 
dejé a mis padres y todo eso. Saliendo uno ya no tiene que haber duda. Tuvimos que arreglar todo, comprar zapatos, comida. Lo crucé yo, intenté dos veces. A la segunda vez pasé. La primera vez me agarraron la mira. Y pues ahí en San Isidro, al tratar de cruzar caminando a la, a la frontera, ahí fue donde me agarró la migra. Este, que me iban a hacer unas preguntas. Pero esas preguntas puta, fueron como... El cinco días en la cárcel, eh, no nos daban de comer, nada, solo nos daban agua y, y pues no, no era suficiente para nosotros. 32, incluyendo a Coyote. Nos tiraron la comida, todo, todo lo que teníamos en la mochila nos sacaron. Lo del trabajo, pues no hay trabajo, no hay mucho. Veníamos, éramos 16, eh, pero nos separamos y... En la migra agarró a otros y a nosotros, nosotros nos escapamos. Sí, corrimos porque ya nos venían siguiendo atrás y después el helicóptero nos seguía igual. Pero como ya agarraron a los otros que se quedaron allá, estancados allá, pues allá se quedaron. Y fue donde ellos se detenieron agarrándolo a ellos y a nosotros dejaron. Ir. La noche en el desierto está totalmente oscuro. De, de momentos se aparecía la, la luna y se veía claro el camino. Bueno, uno nunca sabe si regresar o no. Caminamos como tres noches, partes en bicicleta, partes caminando. Mantenerse uno despierto de noche por, por estar un poco más listo del, del peligro, pues ya sea de cualquiera, que pueda pasar un animal o algo. Eh, dormíamos en el, allá en el suelo, entre las piedras, entre las ramas, allá nos quedábamos todo lo que es, todo el día, y ya cuando la tardecita llegábamos, es pues cuando ya caminábamos en el desierto. Durante el día se duerme. Lo más cabrón que pueda decir y contar uno es la sed. Y luego, bueno, uno nunca sabe si regresar o no regresar. Y me tuve que, este, todos traíamos nuestros garrafones de agua, pero ya como al segundo día, pues ya nos traíamos. Caminé cuatro, tres, tres noches. Tres días. Y un día, todo, todo el día. En el camino miras huesos, miras este, ropa tirada o cuerpos así que ya están, o tumbas. Muchas cruces. Y en una de esas correteadas que le da la migra, digamos, vamos a decir, a veces se, se desaparta uno de, 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 de la manada. Que nos tuvimos que separar el grupo, bueno, por miedo. Nada más una muchacha se quedó en el camino, eh, como que se desmayó. Y yo la vi, le palpé cómo se sacó los calcetines y todas las uñas de su pie estaban levantadas. Me da un poco de miedo, digo yo, estoy solo en este país, me llega a pasar algo y no tengo a nadie. Bueno, sí la dejaron pues, porque la verdad uno que más pudiera uno ayudarle, o es ella o eres tú. Cuando cruzamos de, con el desierto, llegamos a la orilla de la carretera allá en Phoenix. El coyote que nos llevaba nos con, conectó con otro señor que nos trajo para California. Eh, es que cuando uno llega aquí por primera vez, uno llega aquí a, a, a lo desconocido. Es que cuando uno llega aquí por primera vez, uno llega aquí a, a, a lo desconocido. So, I like to start showing that piece <clears throat> because uh, I've been wanting to make work that talk about my experience, but me as part of this community. Um, and when I was planning on making this piece, I wanted to tell you just as much as my personal experience as like the people I used to work when I moved here in 2005. I, I crossed the border, I lived in Boston working in construction and working in, in concrete companies and construction companies. So thinking in the way to I can transmit that experience but not make it special in the way that could make me the center of the problem or the center of the drama. I invite people to my studio from the people I used to work. So I went to Home Depot, I get the workers, and I could invite them to tell me their story. And when I collect all the stories, I edit and I put together something that resembles my personal story um, through, the, through the multiple voices and the multiple experiences. So uh, I didn't want to have one particular person as the center. I, I, I didn't want a talking head. I just wanted this like face of a 
being part of a, in a stable place. Uh, there's this cheaping container looking an unknown place where people don't feel that they are quite there and it looks like a place that is transporting you somewhere. So I, I start building these interviews and, and in general all my work when I have that is I, I count with people to tell me their experience and I can embed the experience into like my narrative but try to respect what they are telling me. Um, you know, while I was making this piece, I really, can you keep the lights off the whole time? I don't know if it's gonna like destroy your camera, but I just, um, I, I make this piece um, <clears throat> and I was feeling that uh, this nostalgia for the place that uh, after talking to, you know, 20 or 30 people about how they felt at home and all the risk, and I moved here to be an artist, so it, it, it was a very different experience than a lot of the people I work in construction. Um, so for first time, after like seven years, I started feeling lonely and missing my family. So I've been here 12 years and I only have one. I come back home twice. So this was the first time I decided to come back home, uh, mostly because I got my papers, I got my green card, so I was able to leave. I flew to Peru, I took pictures, I, I went from Peru by bus to Santiago, which take around like two weeks to get um, by ground. And I was taking a lot of pictures of landscapes and, and trying to translate this loneliness. And when I get to Chile and I spend a little time in Santiago, I, I realized I really don't miss it at all. I was like, after a month, I was like, oh, I just wanna go back to the States. So I come back and, I, and, I, and I, what I do with those feelings, how is that like people can risk their life to not be home and miss the home? And I just, just wanna keep living here and I wanna like figure out where those feelings come from. So I start making this series of photographs that they are, <clears throat> um, part, they are, composite of uh, different places I have been. So I started stitching with film in the dark room, these like many different landscapes I have taken to build a place that purposely looked nostalgic, a place that doesn't really exist. Uh, so somebody maybe like me can put their version of nostalgia for home. So I was building all these places in, um, in the dark room. Um, you, you, can, you can see this one right now is at the it's at the Henry Art Gallery, so if you can, this photo is, is from my MFA thesis show, and, uh, and it still is in view there. So if you have a time to travel, they put a nice show together with the permanent collection. Um, so <clears throat> I was driving around a lot of the country at the time, and I, all the jobs I was doing, and doing, you know, working, moving companies, work, building houses in, in the middle of nowhere. So I was doing a lot of this performance. I have a, like a very lonely practice where I would go around and make this. And again, thinking about what it means to be part of somewhere and, and, and I was doing this series where I could consider what is the minimum gesture for something to be considered a house. And you know, like I, I drive around or like to walk around with my parents around Santiago and my dad all the time had this mentality of like, well, if I had money, I could buy that house. If I had money, I could buy that house. And, <clears throat> and I grew up with that. Like he fantasized with places that he would like to own or live or build. And, and now as an adult, I just don't want to live in anywhere. Like, I mean, LA is the first place I have been stable for like a year in like five years since I finished undergrad, uh, since I finished grad school. I started doing residencies around the country, so for five years I was moving from city to city, doing residencies and making projects. And so I started making this series of photos where like just a minimum effort to call something a home. And, and, and then I did my first residency. Um, <clears throat> And, and it's funny because the first residency I did was Escohigan, was, was probably the, the hardest residency to get in. It was my, my, my first experience, so I, I also for the first time I met all these international artists and people that kind of knew what they were doing. 
and I never, I never had a studio. So I was in this box in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's, in the, it's in the middle of nowhere in Maine, so it's like the closest art supply, supply store was Walmart. So I did, I, I, it wasn't like, I, it wasn't the place to play an artist with all the tools that an artist have, but I have all these brilliant people around me. So I started thinking deeply about what to do with these landscapes I have and how I can project my, my feelings from the inside the studio. And, and that time informed something that I still do, where I was using the landscapes and thinking, okay, what I have, what is the only thing I have here is like they have free photocopies. So I, 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 in the office, so I could go to the office, make a file like a, a like a eight feet by ten feet landscape and divide it in, gri in a grid of photocopies of 11 by 8, and then I, I could put together this, and this felt so natural because this place that doesn't exist, this place I'm fantasizing about belonging, is made ultimately out of a lot of paperwork. Uh, to me, the photocopies is the material of bureaucracy. So uh, it felt logical, and still, um, in the biggest landscapes that you can see right now outside of PNCA, I have this huge landscapes in the outside the fence, and they are all made of photocopies, so a lot of labor, a lot of like work, and a lot of like the paperwork that requires to make this land, or the fantasy, is very part of the, the immigrant experience. And so I was building these beautiful tableaus, and they're like very nice images. I, I just didn't like them, because of uh, they felt like a trumpet oil, they felt like a, I was aiming towards painting, and I wanted to make something that was visual arts, but not trying to make a painting, not, not trying to make the, the beauty be the first thing that you encounter. So instead of switching, I just thought that the more logical approach was like to back up and let, um, and, and show evidence the production, evidence the resources that an artist have to like make the image happen because you know, in, in Chile, I grew up super poor, so like, you know, I'm the first one in my family to go to college. I mean, me and my sister were the first ones to go to college. So, um, to me, always felt that that the smart people go to college. And in order to leave my neighborhood, you know, all, all my friends from the neighborhood they still live in the same house and they have kids. And they, from all my friends, uh, we are the first one to go to college too. So. I wanted to evidence to myself and to my audience that like how to make images, like the process of making images. I wanted to demythify the process. And, and a lot of the time when you watch the making of a movies, you are, it's evidencing the, the cost and the value of the making of the images. So I wanted to invite you to look at the image. And so instead of like faking and like trying to make an optical illusion, I wanted to just like tell you there is artistry in the making, in the production of them. Uh, you know, this, this series called The Goalkeeper, uh, I, I, I look at myself as the goalkeeper in some way, uh, and it's an interesting thing. I, you will see I do in my work, um, and there's a lot of analogies to sport, uh, specifically to soccer, because, um, you know, in this case, the, the, the goalkeeper keep, um, you see the whole game, you see the structure of the game, but you participate very little of the game. So there is something interesting about it. It's like thinking um, like you understand it and nobody gives you the ball and like, you know, when the, when, when the team is, well, well the, when the team is scored, no one, no one come to hug you, you know, but like <laughs> when, the, when, when the team loses, it's your fault. I, I think like that is like, kind of that's what like immigrants are in society, so that is like, you're like the responsible and they want to be blamed all the time. <laughs> so like having that responsibility, give it a little bit of responsibility of the, uh, to the viewer. And also another thing during the, the photo, the, my photography you will see is like, uh, it's always in the same vantage point. Like the, I let the materials perform for you. Like I, I'm also my first audience. So I go behind the camera, I look at what they need to be addressed and, and I need to be satisfied with the image. So it's not this like, it's not a matter of sensibility in some way, it's more about it, like, transmitting the experience of making the image. Um, you know, there is, there is some offshoot. This is not part of the goalkeeper, but it, it really embodies what I, what I mean with the production of this like, Dolly track. 
and the, and the landscape and, <coughs> and the production of image that the production of image is an image in itself and it's sometimes it's much more honest, you know, when a lot of the time, um, you know, mostly with um, uh, the, the shift in, uh, in image making and, and movies, you, you encounter a lot of the time that is, um, there is a documentary style and, and a lot of, you see indie movies now with famous actors and there's like, so there's not a real authenticity in the production that make you believe in the real. Um, um, so yeah, I try to evolve into the production and when, when I make images, a lot of times I hire people to help me to build stages and I try to, you know, I hire a lot of workers from Home Depot, from, um, the, in this case, uh, in Seattle, there's this place called La Casa Latina that uh, provides work for uh, um, undocumented people, so I hire them all the time to help me to build the stage for the next movie I'm gonna show you. But in between the building of the stage, I was um, taking breaks and playing soccer with them. So I was documenting them playing soccer in some way to like show the way that they, you know, the body looks like when you're chasing something. And it's very, very, very simple metaphor of the ball as this thing that you chase, but like I wanna see the, 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 the effort you put in everything. You know, when they were making the green screen, I, I, I started documenting them making the green screen, and, and this led me to a different body of work that, but this image particularly awake a lot of things in my, in my, in my production where um, you have the green screen, which is this artifact that Hollywood uses to not have to build stages, to not have to build anything, and they can replace it for, any given scenario, so, and you have the labor that's supposed to make this impeccable green screen, so the labor will disappear. I mean, also, you walk inside this room and everything is clean and, ni and nice, and the only time you see that these kind of jobs are not made is when, if the trash can is full, you know that there is something missing, that the only time that this kind of labor manifests is when it's not being done. Like, nobody says thank you for doing it, you just like, you just punish people when they're not doing it right. You know, so like, there's a lot of jobs that they're, 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 their main objective is invis invisibility in the same way that the green screen is supposed to be invisible. So uh, capturing the moment before total invisibility is really interesting. And, and these guys helped me to make this movie. ¿Qué quieres que haga? Yo quiero a mi hijo. Por lo tanto, te vas a quedar aquí hasta que nazca. Quiero que te cuides para que nazca en las mejores condiciones. Quiero que seas fuerte. Eso es lo único que te pido. No vas a volver a mirarme la cara. Ya no tenemos nada más que hablar. Vamos a esperar el nacimiento del niño, eso es todo. Después tendrás que irte. Es lo mínimo que te puede pasar después de todo lo que hiciste. Te vas a ir para no volver nunca más. Y te olvidarás de ese niño para siempre. Cuando se trata de, de protegerme a mí misma, siento que, que no lucho lo suficiente. Y siento que soy fuerte porque llegué a este país sin conocer a nadie. Y como muchas de, de ellas, me encontré con un país donde había mucho racismo, tanto en un trabajo como en la comunidad, como en la sociedad. Este, y sab, supe salir adelante sin ayuda de nadie. Y por eso a veces veo atrás y veo que soy fuerte, porque todavía estoy aquí sin necesidad de que alguien tuvo que empujarme. Tuve dos hijos y nunca tuve el apoyo como en nuestros países, de nuestros padres, de tener una madre, una amiga, alguien que me ayudara a saber cómo proteger a ese niño. Y yo veo ahorita a mis hijos grandes, 
uno que ya se graduó y uno que está en la high school. Y me veo fuerte. Y mucha gente que me conoce me dice, eres fuerte, eres... Siempre empezaba en un trabajo desde abajo, siempre dishwasher y era manager, housekeeper y era manager. Y yo sé que soy fuerte, pero en mi vida personal siento que no lo suficientemente fuerte para decidir y hablar por mí. Y entonces quisiera tener ese poder de, des de no tener miedo a mí misma, de cuando yo decida algo por mi vida, sea porque yo lo estoy decidiendo por mí y no por miedo a hacerle daño a los demás. ¿Qué quieres que haga? Yo quiero a mi hijo. Por lo tanto, te vas a quedar aquí hasta que nazca. Y quiero que te cuides para que nazca en las mejores condiciones. Quiero que seas fuerte. Eso es lo único que te pido. No vas a volver a mirarme la cara. Ya no tenemos nada más que hablar. Vamos a esperar el nacimiento del niño, eso es todo. ¿Y después? Después tendrás que irte. Es lo mínimo que te puede pasar después de todo lo que hiciste. Te vas a ir para no volver nunca más. Y te olvidarás de ese niño para siempre. ¿Ves? De nuevo. Otra vez de nuevo me mentiste. ¿Quién crees que soy? ¿Eh? ¿Quién crees que soy? ¿Eh? ¿Por qué te burlas? ¿Por qué te burlas? Es una burla. Es una burla. No es solo una mentira. Es una burla. ¿Quién crees que soy? Mi papá está muerto y yo no lo pude perdonar. Y precisamente eso me hace sentir aún más eh, como un extraño dentro de mi propia familia. Eh, soy la única persona que decidió que la única forma de poder dormir sin tener pesadillas, cortar de raíz. Bueno, yo creo que siempre la pregunta que me he hecho es eh, si, o sea, realmente estoy, en, estoy equivocada, o sea, de, no tengo derecho a sentirme como me siento o a pensar como pienso o a actuar como actúo. Se supone que yo tengo que seguir al clan y complacer, complacer al, al resto de la familia. ¿Y cuáles han sido tus respuestas? Aborrezco, aborrezco la situación y me aborrezco a mí misma por la forma en que me hace sentir. ¿Cómo puede ser posible? No es justo. ¿Por qué? ¿Por 
Kijk aan mij. Odio. Odio, rencor y aborrezco esto. Y me aborrezco yo. Y la situación. So, I, <clears throat> for that piece, uh, this uh, excerpt, you can go to my webpage and watch the whole thing. It's 20 minutes long. I, I hired 15 real mate in Seattle to learn this script um, about this telenovela from Chile. That is about a mate that gets pregnant and have to leave the kid. And so I wanted to point out the flaws in representation that when it comes to working class women particularly, I grew up in a house full of women that have service jobs in industry, so uh, what to me was important to, you know, I, I, and in the works from here on on, I'm trying to always build um, an alternative world where like you can, the media that you're missing exists and like I respond to it. Like, um, I'm not as antagonist as like, and kind of like somewhat of an optimist about like the possibilities of the same representation have a better purpose. So making a movie with real mates about their personal experiences, it is uh, is important to me in the same way that um, <clears throat> that in this project, the future ruins, where uh, you know Seattle is changing in the same way that Portland is changing, and I and and I, and I was thinking. Um, you know, maybe in the future, uh, museums will not look like a perfect white cube, but it's still going to be a place that you need to go and draw culture and and absorb knowledge. So in this case, uh, let me transform the whole space and you know uh, make all these graphite drawings on the walls and cover and the uh, and I left the, the the scaffolding that I was using to do the drawings. And, and leave the paper that to cover the floors, and leave it in a plan. And then I make this whole series of photos about um, about the concept of ruins, and you know, also responding to photography and challenging the ideas behind photography, specifically to uh, ruin porn or the documentation of sadness and the documentation of pain. Um, you know, when you go to Mexico, Peru. Italy, you see ruins and you see them as a source of knowledge and a, as an as a index of higher culture. While you go to USA, cities like uh, you know, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Detroit, and these ruins are only signifiers of economic collapse and social decay. And so where are the places to learn? Um, so I start building this new city of photos they were trying to be the, how to represent the feeling of ruin without going to these particular communities and taking advantage of the social pain. How to like, uh, what is the minimum gesture to cause something a ruin? And one not of using anyone. So I was making all these photos and in my studio, from my studio thinking about like, what are the possibilities for things to move around? Um, and and there is, then they are in the between, in between being destroyed and in the between being built. So, I, uh, this series called hedonic reversal. H uh, hedonic reversal is a psychological condition that makes you pursue pain. Um, so, if you like sad movies or you like a spicy food, that is a hedonic reversal, something that makes you feel a little bit more alive. Um, so together with the exhibition, I have this three channels video that was about uh, the maintenance that required this destruction. Uh, I, uh, that, that year, the, the Seahawks have won the, the Super Bowl, and, uh, and the city was a mess because people celebrate a lot. So, so there is an aftermath for passion. I mean, like, you know, the, the, the Seahawks fan called themselves the 12 men, but then the the 13 men have to come and clean what the 12 men made. So like, 
I make a video about. Um, and also, it, it comes again with like my family history that like, you know, thinking that most of my friends from my neighborhood went to technical schools and went to and, uh, the neighborhood particularly I grew up was a government housing where a lot of people were like cops kids or like uh, firemen kids, you know, like jobs that supposed to not, never end. So that was the dream. Like how about becoming a cop, it was like you never really get fired for those jobs. So like you, just, you can just like have that job for, for the rest of your life despite if you are good or bad at it. So like, <clears throat> so like this is, my dad is a mailman. So like he just retired after like, you know, he's had the job since he was like 18 to now he's like 65. So. Uh, it's the same job, which is like unthinkable for anybody in our generation in 2013 to have the same job for like 50 years astray. Um, so the Sisyphean mentality of wanting to like do the same thing over and over and over again, it, it is it's very interesting to me. So I, I made this video about... Now here's why you can win on little things, and we'll be talking with you about little things as long as you're here on little things and a little something extra. Now let's just suppose that we say that, that uh, the maximum ability one can have is 100. That's the way we'll approach it. And let's say here I am, someone that, that really only has, based on that 100, a 75% or 75 ability. And here over here, is someone that has 85 that I'm going to play against. Now, it, it takes everyone, but this is just for you, you as an individual. Now, on Saturday, by virtue of the fact that you have paid the price, you've learned those lessons, you work on the little things. I don't hesitate. You know, leg. like when a man, the boss tell me to do something, I just do it. I don't hesitate. I don't complain, you know. Because you working just like I'm working. We okay, all gonna get paid the same amount of money, you know? Now here's another man over here that's playing against you. Now this could happen, it don't always happen. So I was teaching at Rice University at that time and um and I, so I have access to the, the you know, food, college football in Texas is huge, so there was big parties every time. So I was able to go to the stadium at night and follow the cleaning crew. And then I invite one of the cleaning crew members to come to my studio and show me their technique that they used to clean the stadium more efficiently. And I overlap it, I, I interview him a little bit and I overlap it with pet talks of the coach. Which, which is interesting that you hear it. the pet talk is never about the game itself. It's about like building this part of the soul of the player. And another thing is interesting happening in sports is that like you have the cleaning crew, all older black men, and then you see younger people of color on the on the on the football field. Uh, you know, so there is a sandwich of like class struggle in some way that like people for scholarships and 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 physical build go to this uh, their part of the team, and then at night these other people of color come and clean, and in between there is this like an audience, an audience that wanna be entertained and disregard what happened with their food and the drinks and so so to me it was interesting this uh, and. You know, you do it slowly because you want to get the, the most hours, pay for the most hours. So it, it was, um, was very fascinating to me to like make this project, you know. And at the same time, living in Texas, uh, the, and I always struggle showing this world right now because now here. because of like the, all the news of the the, the the monuments and and all the. But I moved there like three years ago, and I started making this project in 2015. Um, 16 about the monuments because anybody that moved somewhere should like I was confronted with those monuments and I was like how is that but to me the important thing is is not that they exist and in the same way I'm going to talk later about the 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 protests and the barricade is like like the, it's a very political and issue of like trying to take a monument down but I think to me, more combative, um, a more 
political could be try to erect 10 monuments for people that you love rather than take it one down. So you outnumber all the time people that you hate. And so, and that I think can be very productive. But the fears, and that's the main problem with the, you know, Democratic Party right now that doesn't know where to stand. And that's why you have like, you have very solid stance from, you know, whatever you consider the wrong belief from the right wings. But they have a very solid vote, wrong values, but they have very solid stance. And so like, if you don't know which monuments you want to erect, it's a problem, it's on you. So you have to build 10 for each one. So traveling around South America and traveling around other countries, in Chile we have these animitas, these monuments for people that get shot in the street or run over by a car. Sometimes you see them here on the side of the road. Um, so to me, the question was like, uh, I see so many monuments for unknown people in downtown, uh, like in the Mexico City, and in Lima, and Santiago, and there is none here, right? So what are the right physical or architectural conditions for something to be called a monument, and who needs to be remembered? Because you see a lot of these ones in Chile, and you see these ones in the middle of nowhere, you know? so. Um, so maybe if I make something that resembles monumentality, and also the question of like the war, what is really the word monumental means, or monument, where monumentality reside? Is in the scale, is in the shape, is in the structure, is in the placement, where I can, where I can allocate monumentality? And so I, I designed something that look a little bit like a, like an Aztec monument, a little bit like a futuristic monument, a little bit like a socialist monument, and I, I make this play, this thing in the gallery first. And then with the pieces that, you know, this modular piece, my idea was able to like make a, mod, a, a modular piece. I could give somebody that their kid die and then you make them a monument that is more beautiful and interesting than the other ones. Um, so this is the wall to like consider the scale of the monument and then I, the wall was embedded onto the gallery's wall, and then I make these serious photos that they were the, all the possibilities for these images, all for this uh, monument to become. Um, so I start making this series of photos. Uh, something that happened with the photos is that because they are trying to be a memorial site too, I photographed the initial element, and then I print a very large negative. Um, as a negative, and I glue it on the wall, and then I paint everything else black. So, um, so the last photo I take, I rephotograph that. So the last photo, it is a negative, but it looks positive. In some way, it's to remark on the photography being this portal between the life and death of photography at the same time of the life and death of the person that is representing. This is another installation I did in Vienna with the piece. Um, I'm just gonna move really quick. This is a project I did uh, in 2013 or 14. At the, um, I like this project, I like to show it because also it's like, it's one of the first shows I have in Portland. It was in the community college and at Clark College. And I really like it because I, I involve all the students and, uh, and I was able to like, teach the students how to make a drawing on the walls of one of these landscapes as a way to build a team that want to have a common goal that is very clear. And then I send the students with clay and they, I ask them to reproduce something from their home to um, you know, make you understand that I mean, there is craft and there is complexities in every element that you have at your house. So it's so easy to undermine our experience and, and to think that like your life is not complex and these political problems come from somewhere else and this, the news are happening tragical things. But there is a little tragic into living in a city where everybody is the same skin color and there is a little bit where everybody have the same social class. There is something that's happening. There is an internal trauma. So if you are escaping somewhere, if you are all from the same religion and all from the same class, there is something happened there. So like I wanted people to like look inside and in, in front of me a small gesture to think about the materials that they use to facilitate your life. You know, the, the, the project was called um, Help Wanted, you know. I mean, only, on, only charity jobs uh, have the sign Help Wanted. You know, like 
there is nobody, nowhere has a self help wanted a CEO. Or like nobody have like a, you know, so like you have, so like, and also for young people, which also leads me to the show that is upstairs, is like, because capitalism have pushing you so much, you assume that there's a certain pain in work, that you don't supposed to enjoy your job. Like if you enjoy it, you, you, you shouldn't get paid. So like in this movie, I'm not gonna show it. There it literally, I felt every day so going to work, work that I was using. So I asked all the students to tell me their shitty job experience. And they were all talking at the same time. And about, um, you know, and everybody had had a shitty job experience. Mostly uh, this project was particularly tailored for the community college experience because I, I love teaching in community college. Everybody, you know, 80% of people went to the labor market and decide that this sucks and then going to go to education to improve their life. So like everybody in community college have had some sort of a little more life experience than the regular like college students. So <clears throat> it was very important to me making this project there. Um, you can see one of these things in the, in the, in the, in the third floor too. I was doing a, um, a residency in San Francisco at the, and I had access to the Labor for Research Center in San Francisco State University. So I started using all the labor, um, all the logos from the disappeared labor unions. And while I started scanning it and erasing the words and erasing the numbers, I realized they all look like soccer teams and like an, 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 an military symbols, which are the only two institutions now that we put our sense of brotherhood. And, uh, you know, like we just said, the only time that you get like 20,000 people to agree on something is with the Seahawks or like with, like with, them, with invading another country. It's like you never could agree, like we should all get paid the same, right? Like nobody, nobody, we should all get health insurance. Nobody agree with those that beside like, but that was a great touchdown. <laughs> like that is the only time you agree with something. So like I, I have these like flags of like um, symbols that they're disappearing and they, you can see the, the wearing and tearing on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the flags. You know, screen printing on the light, you know, all those, it's hard to reproduce, but these lightings, uh, these light tables, they are not only for light, they are like information. So you see all the archival images from Cesar Chavez time. Um, the one to the left has all the label, the original logos. The one to the left, farther left, um, in the floor has um, movies, uh, little movie strips from movies that, um, <clears throat> like um, Norma Ray or On the Waterfront, movies about labor union. Um, you know, like movies don't, since in America, like in America there's no movies about like people having a job. Like, I mean, you can have a job, but then you get, you have to get superpowers. If, <laughs> if not, the movie is not about you at all. Like it's just like you have to, if you deliver newspapers, it's not about you. Like, so like, it is interesting because in, in Europe you still can see, in South America you still see the movies that are about like a guy that have a cherry job and that is a job and this is war, you know, and, and, and there is a lot of drama in it. So I make the movie that, you know. Hey, ¿sabe qué? Yo tengo 64 años. Yo tengo 35 años en este país. Yo hablo inglés. Yo tengo mi papel. Yo no tengo porque yo trabajo como gringo. Yo no estoy acostumbrado ya a trabajar como latino ni como francés. Yo trabajo como latino, como americano. Ellos me pagan, yo le hago su trabajo, lo hago de lo mejor que puedo y págame mi dinero y ahí estamos en paz. ¿Entiendes? Mañana, si te gustó y quieres que yo vuelva a necesitar mi servicio, Aquí estoy yo. Si no, mira, dame la mano y ya. Pero no me debe nada. Compañero, pues tú a un compañero, un compañero hispano, pues no lo vas a apoyar. Sí. Mira, eh, eh. Yo, yo te voy a decir algo, porque eso ¿Sí? es una, una cosa. Porque estamos hablando ahora sí del sindicalismo de aquí nosotros, okay. de todos de aquí. Si tú no eres, tú no eres unido con todos los, los hispanos, no, no lo vas a ayudar, le vas a dar una patada por el rabo. No. Y órale. No. no, es para ayudarlo, ayudar a uno 
y darle, decirle, ¿sabes qué onda, compañero? Vamos a salir adelante, vamos a deja eso, vamos a echarle ganas, vamos a hacer lo otro y órale, vamos a estar unidos, porque unidos siempre vamos a tener la fuerza, si no, no la vamos a okay, tener. Ok, mira, déjame decirte porque yo he aprendido en este país, ok, a eso mismo. Tú, en este país, tú tienes que sacar las uñas que tú tienes, ok, tú no puedes esperanzarte a que yo te ayude, ni que el otro te ayude, ni nadie. Porque como tú viniste a este país, tú viniste solo. Ok. Lo que estamos tratando aquí es, es un, sindi un sindicato. ¿sí? No estamos hablando de otras cosas, de la unión, okay, si no estamos en la unión, por eso mismo estamos como estamos, porque no ¿Sí? podemos tener unión, y aparentemente, aparentemente tú, por, por lo que has dicho, tú, tú no apoyarías la unión, tú no apoyarías, no, no, no apoyarías no, la unión, no, 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 pero él mismo lo dice. Yo trabajo como un americano. Y ni, ni yo vine solo aquí. Está, él está hablando de manera individual y egoísta. Está hablando de manera individual y egoísta. Lo cual se deduce, se deduce que él no podría... No, de ninguna, sería difícil para él trabajar en unión con los demás latinos y, y, y organizarse. Ya sea en forma de... To, again, I was doing a residency in Omaha, Nebraska, and I have this, all this space. I just have come back from Chile at that time. It was my second time traveling there. And, you know, I have one of these friends that, like, I mean, I had this idea of making the movie, but it helped that, like, one of my best friends growing up, like, he started this scam making t-shirts and, like, having a screen print in his house. So I was like, oh, can you make me these t-shirts? So I brought from Chile, like, like 12 t-shirts that from the labor union. So the only idea I have is, that, like, I knew I wanted to make my version of 12 Angry Men uh, thinking about the uh, labor union. So I bought a lot of, I, I went to the Home Depot, I, got, I hired the guys, I invite them to have beers, to play soccer, and then I sit them to talk about labor unions and how to associate. If you notice, the guy that is more combative about not forming the unions is the Cuban guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that led me to the next uh, project, the project I showed in um, Up for Gallery uh, last September, um, which is like, you know, direct response to what I don't experience here that I experience a lot at home. You know, I went to University of Chile, which is like, the part of the history of the University of Chile is that like we've been started the protests and and we all the time at the forefront of the social changes in, in Chile. So uh, I, was doing, I was doing all this like uh, research on the barricade and the aesthetic of barricades and how people protest and how people manifest and the way that like you see here um, all the marches that they feel really unproductive. Or, you know, it, it, you know, it's good, it's healthy as a social manifestation, but they ultimately they are headless and they are pointless in some way. They're like, you do it in such a way where like, you know, it's in a Sunday afternoon, you know, and you're like, that when nobody gets affected by anything that you do and you just feel good and then nothing changes. And next day, and probably next month, you have to do another one. Uh, so, and particularly that you never see students protesting here. You know, they are very in a, in, a, in a, and I think Americans understand themselves as customers fears, and then as a, as a social participant. So you will do a lot of things as long as it doesn't affect your credit score, or doesn't affect like you like, you like time working, and doesn't get you in trouble with anyone. So, so there's a combative spirit in Latin America and in the rest of the country that Americans don't have. And you know, I mean, that's why you have a great orderly society that seems to work this part, the amount of people that live here. But also, you're missing out a lot. It's really fun. <laughs> so, like, uh, so I was considering the aesthetic of the, 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 the barricades and thinking about, and at, at the time, I, I, I was reading, I've been reading a lot of 
um, a lot of poets from Chile and a lot of like, uh, I was reading the Canto General, uh, Pablo Neruda's uh, epic book of poems about uh, the history of Latin America, where he tried to recount the story of Latin America from Latin American perspective. So I was thinking, what is the way I can represent these poems or think about my way in the same way that Pablo Neruda decided to use words as a way to combat, colonial, combat colonialism. I, I'm gonna use materials that I'm familiar, that they are, they, they are accessible put to me, to build these barricades that we're missing here, the, the, how I can evidence the thing that we're not doing to build a more just society in some way. So look a lot of archivals of photos, and I start making this series of photos of barricades So, and, and it's an ongoing project um, in some way because I add more elements, um, not to the barricade series, but I, once I build this series, I felt that there could be other elements that people use in term, in, as emergency, as a way to like, build some civil disobedience that is still is accessible to all of us. So it's looking a lot about images from the protesters in Venezuela and in Brazil, um, you know, two countries that they are very troubled right now, but the news, you know, because Trump did tweet something, you avoid, you like forget that the world is like in chaotic because of policies that are before him. And then they were like, and you know, and, and something to teach the students that it is responding to the media is, in, is important, but also research that these problems, they're institutionalized. They don't come from one guy, you know, like, um, you know, the walls been built since Bush administration for a long time. Like, it's just like, the, put it in the forefront, now in the news, it's not also make it a new problem. It's just, there is a budget that you keep building it and building it, and it have happened during Obama time too. You know, so there is like, like, a, and, and being disinformed and not looking at outside yourself, uh, it is very troublesome because you don't learn from what happened in other countries. I mean, the, the, if you could have built more education around what happened in Ukraine, you couldn't be complaining. You could, you could know, you have better tools to like understand what Russia is doing now with uh, with America, and it was very effective in Ukraine. And it's very, and it's, um, and and you see what why Venezuela is having shortage of oil. It's not, it's not an insulation. It's not that they are bad at managing their money or the resources. There is a I mean, it is, it is very interesting because America is in the center of all those problems and, and it's very particular about, uh, you know, a project I'm not showing right now, it touches a little bit on the, the history of the desert and the landscape as a place of possibilities and a place of uh, opportunities, but also as a place of loneliness and memory. <clears throat> you know, the <clears throat> I was talking to a, a journalist this week about the history of a, uh, I don't have the pieces here, so it's, it seems very, but I'm making these paintings about the landscape. The ones that you can see at PNCA, and thinking about the landscape in Chile and in the, in the Atacama Desert. That, that, that landscape is full of history, and in some ways is linked to the history of America, because you know the, the, the only reason that we got Pinochet is because, you know, like, he took back all the all the copper companies from the cop from the de from the from the desert, and then America was like, mm, no, we want them back. That is ours, and so, and so we're gonna like pay Kissinger, put a bunch of money, and you know, the Stacia Coop, and then tons of millions of like people disappear in the desert. So that desert in Chile is like there's a lot of bodies buried because of uh, the imperialism present on the and the like the way that neoliberalism imposed itself into, the, into Latin America. So, um, that's a sidetrack, but you know, the landscape is charged with things, and in the same way that the idea of like, manifest destiny and home state act happened in California, it, it is charged with the history of uh, colonialism that America has. So, these masks are really interesting, and they're beautiful as an object, and they're really weird. So, so I decided to make them in my studio. And again, because I'm working with the idea that Neruda's poem, he's working with clay. I mean, he's talking about Latin America being this 
everything comes from the clay, from the, from the mouth up. Um, you know, I cover myself with clay and I and make this mask and reflective tape, that's a safety tape, they say, the tape that you use in the street to build this mask as a, like this portrait of, uh, of the possibilities of the, of the trash to become a, um, and yeah, that, that is the last, that, this I did last week, so this is very new and I'm gonna show it next week. So there is a, and so that is a, this is a movie that you can see upstairs. Where like, again, it's an exercise portraiture. I'm very interested right now in like, what portrait can inform about the face and the struggle that you have inside. You know, the masks are picking up trash from the street, but you know, um, uh, the system is, is set up for people that have a certain economic fitness to survive, you know? So like if this new body of work I'm making about uh, internship culture and the way that the system is set up for people that have the money to do an internship and work on an organization and be an, an artist assistant for free for six months or a year, uh, have bigger chances to, so, to succeed in the art. Um, not sometimes, you know, if you even you go to law school, you have to work so like making photocopies for like six months. Somewhere. You know, like this, this, this is a flawful, this is a problem in the way we understand labor and work and the value of our actions in society. So um, in this case, I put the people uh, doing setups, planks in the, in the air, and I document them from the cameras in the ceiling so you can see them struggling and try to hold their body position. Um, to make the analogy between um, economic fitness and and really physical endurance, right? right? If you if you can if you can hold physically living in New York for a year for and work for free, maybe you're gonna have a career. Maybe you can maybe you can build a resume. But most of us we can't, you know. So so there is a certain anxiety and pain into being part of a contemporary society that these videos are trying to make you reflect on it and think about it uh, and for once look at a person straight to the eyes and, and, and understand their struggle. You can see the rest upstairs. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. There is a, you know, I, I, I think there is materials that are embedded with some political uh, uh, patina in some way, like, you know, the, the use of photocopies, the way I've displayed the landscapes, for example, outside with mark making and, and in a public sphere. And, uh, but I, I'm also, you know, also, I'm a visual artist, and I, I like beauty, and I like a lot of things that are not part of like the 
I, I don't want to sit here and talk about the value of the colors and the value of the composition, but they are important to me. I make. I mean, there is a lot of gratuity into those like free expressions that you have to have in your studio. You know, the shapes I I make for the for the nimitas, so all the decisions, all the aesthetic decisions. They don't come from directly from a political reflection. You know, there is no one shape that represents. Hugo Chavez, and there's no another shape that represents Lula, and there is no another shape that represents, uh, you know, so like there is like, th there is the need to be certain artistic freedom, and, and if you want to read more into it, and you want to live with it, you know, I think like, I think they are, I'm an audience too, I like to see beautiful, interesting things that, that, uh, that catches your eye, and, and I think that is, Part of my part of my job too. So when you get the the donic the donic reversals pieces, you can you can project a lot into them. And as I, sometimes it's the ruins and the ruins is charged with it. Sometimes you may be stuck in the optical illusions that have. You know when you see the landscapes, you can you may be stuck in the texture, or you may be wanted to read into the forms and the placement and the, the way that you want to understand landscape, what it means to you. But I also leave them open for interpretations. So, you know this is this is one of the readings, but I am not uh, I'm not completely in control of all the readings, and I, I want to leave them a little bit open. Um, and mostly that is where pursuing some sort of aesthetic high grounds help you. You know to make them interesting for the viewer too, and like. You know, I, I, I don't want to make it super didactic either because uh, I, I would get bored. And also if you would make it super didactic, then I'm not that bad at right. I would write all the time if like that could be my point, uh, just to be example of the political issues I wanted to address. And it could be a lot cheaper. <laughs> so, so it's very part of, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, I think when we, when you're trying to search for the, I mean, other people would say boil it down, other people would say or use other expressions, but to me, figure it out what is the thing that we all want to understand. Uh, I think there's a common denominator, and that usually is not as complex as you think it is. So I think like trying to search for those moments where like we're gonna get it without being super elaborate, but while still being articulated about it, it is uh, it is complicated, and a lot of the poetic gestures that are trying to pursue come from that, come from like trying to find the simplicity on the best way to be eloquent about it, and just trying to like show you, you know, like, <clears throat> I mean, also it's part of the photographic history. It's like, you know, uh, like uh, trying to think uh, the index of the problem or like what is the, what is the, what is the stamp that this problem could leave? And that mark is enough, you know? It can be threatened like a pa, like a, like a, the wrong pa in, in the middle of the forest can give you fear or can be your comfort, you know? So like that is like, that mark, it means a lot more and that is, you don't need to build a, a giant. You don't need to build something that is scary. If you can make the right mark that tells you danger, that is, that, that is a good analogy, I think, for like what, what I consider the minimum gesture. Yeah. Mm. No mas? That's good. Thank you very much for your question.